me invite you, if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 5. Uh, Luke chapter 5. If, uh, if you're following along in a device, uh, the version that we use here at Redemption is the Christian Standard Bible. And so uh, that's probably in your drop-down menu. That will make it a little easier to follow along as we read together this morning. Uh, and so I want to invite you to pick up in Luke chapter 5. Uh, so we, we started this series back in Easter, just going uh, section by section, chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke, investigating the claims, the personhood the divinity of Jesus, recognizing that the single most important question in human history is not, is the Bible true? Is it trustworthy? Can we rely on scripture? That, those are good questions, not the most important question. The most important question is, did Jesus raise from the dead? That is the most important question, as everything else hinges upon that singular truth. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then everything else Jesus claimed to be is true as well which means Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God, there are radical implications for my life and for your life as well, for every person who's ever lived, for every person that ever will live. And so we've been walking through the gospel of Luke, investigating this. So this is a great series. If you're skeptical, if, you're, uh, if you've got doubts, if you've got some things about faith, Jesus, church, Bible, the history of Christianity, doesn't quite compute, make sense to you, you kind of sit back and go, yeah, I don't know about that. This is a great series for you. So I would invite you to to go back and you can pick up uh, where we began. You can watch online uh, through our website, uh, also on Facebook. And uh, really for today to make as much sense as possible, we would invite you to go back and and watch last week. Because what we said is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, it was going to be critical for us to break this up over three weeks. There's just too much content to do it in one if we're going to do it justice, right? So we had to break this up over three, three weeks. And so this is really the second part through a three-part discussion. Uh, first part began last Sunday. So I'd invite you, if you weren't here and you're looking for uh, something to watch this week, you can go back and you can watch that for everything to make complete and total sense. But what's really cool is when we started in chapter five last week, what we got to see together, and this has been really, really fun, it's been a sweet moment for us, is to see Jesus, his purpose. We saw a shift. We saw a dramatic shift. Jesus went from being healer. Jesus went from being teacher. Jesus went from being maybe a pseudo prophet to now Jesus as rabbi. Jesus calling for himself disciples. So we saw a pretty dramatic shift. We walked through the historical and cultural implications of the day. And so that was really, really important understanding that when Jesus calls the first disciples to himself, we needed to know what's happening in that day, especially in that region of Galilee, in order to understand why Jesus calls his first disciples. And so uh, it's been really, really cool walking through this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick up, we're going to read these 11 verses again. Okay, and then we're going to pick up in our story and along with our narrative and our teaching. So let's look together starting in verse 1, chapter 5 of the Gospel of Luke. It says, as the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennaraset, which we said before was just another term for, anybody remember? Say it again louder. Sea of Galilee. Nice job. You guys all earn candy at the end of service today. Nice job. So yeah, we were paying attention last. Yeah, that's all it took. All right. So uh, Jason, make a mental note. We need to hand out candy more often. Um, but yeah, so if we were paying attention last week, right, it's just another name. It's a cultural name, a regional name. And so uh, looking at verse two, he saw two boats at the edge of the lake. A fisherman had left them. They were fishing. Uh, I'm sorry. They were washing their nets. Verse three, he got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from that boat. Verse four, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long. We've caught nothing, but if you say so, I'll I'll let down the nets. And so verse six says, when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And when they came, they filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those that were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that had been taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus said. Boy, those are sweet words to hear this morning, aren't they? Don't be afraid, Jesus told them. From now on, from now on, you will be catching people. 
Then look at verse 11. This is wild, man. Then they brought their boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Wow, that's pretty impressive. So last week, we walked through this text, and we stopped right at Peter's response to the incredible miracle that had just taken place in the text. Remember? That's kind of where we uh, closed up camp last week. That this amazing miracle happens, all these fish are brought into not one, but two boats. And this miracle had a really profound impact on Peter. Look look again, just real quick in the text. Look at verses 8 through 10, just so we don't miss this. When Peter saw this, when Peter saw what happened, all of these fish that shouldn't have been caught, all of these fish, it, it initiates a response in Peter. It says that he fell at Jesus' knees. Imagine being so shocked and so surprised and so utterly taken aback at what you saw that you fall at your knees. What would it take? What would you have to see? What would be so unbelievably impressive to you that it brings you to your knees? So Peter falls to his knees and he says, go away from me. Go away from me. I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. And so Peter's response, Peter's response, him falling to his knees, telling Jesus to get away from him, it makes sense when we understand that the miracle had very little to do with the catching of fish. You tracking with me? It had very little to do with the catching of fish. It had everything to do with revealing the nature of who Jesus is. Because let me, let me make no mistake. Look here, I don't want you to miss this. Watch this. All the fish that were caught, Every condition to catch that amount of fish was wrong for that level of catch. The middle of the day, the deepest parts of the water, throwing nets that weren't fully mended. After being out all night long, which is what commercial fishermen do, this catch, look here, is impossible. But it is not the catch itself that makes Peter go, no way. It's what it revealed about who Jesus was. This pseudo-teacher, semi-celebrity carpenter from a hick town up north is trying to tell me how to fish, and we catch two boatfuls. There's something about Jesus. And that brings Peter to his knees. And so earlier in the text, Peter calls Jesus what? Anybody remember? What does he call him? Say it louder. He calls him master. He calls him master. And not in the sense that he's the master of his life, but in a term of respect. It's held for those who have authority, those who can teach. It's just like today, if you've ever been in court, you know, put your hands up. (laughs) Though it's a safe place, you know what I'm saying? Go for it. If you've ever, we've all got a past, right? But if you've ever been in court and when you're talking to the judge, you don't, if you don't say, if the judge's name is Tom, you don't go, hey, Tom, listen, let me walk you through what happened. No, we don't do that. We refer to the judge as, say it louder, your honor. So we we recognize this judge has authority, right? The judge isn't the master of your life. They might be master of the moment, you know what I'm saying? But not master of your life. And so you recognize there's a level of authority here, so you call the judge your honor. Same sort of situation here. Jesus, recognizing the authority, right, in himself, calls Peter to do something. Peter, recognizing that authority in Jesus, calls him master. And so there's a recognition of that authority, but it's cultural in this case. But now, in light of what has just happened at this incredible, miraculous event, what does Peter call Jesus now? What does he call him? says it right there. Calls him Lord. From master to Lord in just a small window of time. In both instances, Peter recognizes something in Jesus, and in both cases, he responds to Jesus. Listen, look at me here. I don't care where you are in your faith, and, I, I, and listen, whether you believe in Jesus or not, Jesus, Jesus will always demand a response. Jesus will always demand a response. So whatever you think of Jesus now, And whatever you might think of Jesus down the road, your life will always respond to who Jesus is. That's just bottom line. 
And so when Jesus was just master, it was a lowercase m, and Peter gave him a boat ride and humored his request for a fishing lesson, right? But then Jesus became Lord. And so Peter's response, how does that happen? How do you go from master to Lord? Well, I'll tell you, it's very simple. Spiritual bankruptcy. When do things change in your life? When things are going the most well? When things are going really good? Is that when things change in your life? I mean, when things are just working out really, really well for you, do you, do you stop back and take inventory and go, you know what, I think it's time for a change. Things are just going really good right now. And I want to take the chance of screwing that up. Does anybody do that? Anybody here? Nope. When things are going well, that's like, you're like, don't, we don't change anything. We don't change anything. But what happens when life becomes catastrophic and we hit rock bottom? Is that when we go looking for change? Yeah, it's built within your nature. It's built within your nature. And so Peter comes to a place of absolute spiritual bankruptcy. And now, and now he can respond, Jesus isn't master anymore. Now Jesus is Lord. And why is that? It's because in this miracle, Jesus reveals that he isn't just a healer, that he isn't just a teacher, but that he can also command, that Jesus can command hundreds of fish to get out of the water, into a net, and into a boat. Who is this man that can command even the fish? Later, the disciples will ask that similar question of Jesus when he says, who is this man that he even commands what? Anybody remember? The storm. That the winds and the water obey him. This miracle reveals something very special. And not only that, that Jesus has the capacity to also tell a couple of fishermen where to go in order to catch this level of fish. And so Peter is overwhelmed. Peter is humbled. His pride, his pride, men hear me, his pride is drained away. And all that is left is a sense of sinfulness in the presence of this man. That Jesus was so good and such goodness in his character was revealed that it absolutely spiritually bankrupted Peter to the point that his pride was stripped away and all he had was a full recognition of how sinful and wrong he is in light of how good and perfect and right Jesus is. Imagine that. So Peter's response, it's raw Peter's response is honest. Keep in mind, he is a commercial fisherman. He does command a crew of people. He is pretty intelligent. He's educated. He's not a country bumpkin. Peter has some chops. And all the dudes that he's fishing with are looking at him right now. You with me? And everyone's amazed at what just happened. Did you just, did we all just see this? This is real, right? And Peter's response is total bankruptcy. He falls to his knees. And his response is so vulnerable. It's so transparent. It's void of stubbornness. It's void of pride. And he is faced with the truth of who Jesus is and immediately responds appropriately. Why? Because Peter is special? No, Peter is not special. Later, you'll find out that Peter... While he looks kind of like a rock star in his humility in this moment, is the same dude that doubts Jesus and nearly drowns, is the same guy that because of a middle school girl ends up even denying the fact that he knew Jesus and he runs out screaming. So Peter's not special, gang. He doesn't receive a special dispensation because he's Peter. Peter was an ordinary guy in every sense of the word. And apart from Jesus, look at me. I want you to hear me say this. This is really, really important. Apart from Jesus, history would have soon forgotten about this man named Peter. You understand? If it were not for Jesus, Peter wouldn't have existed. He would have lived in his day, but history would have forgotten him. I mean, he wasn't tearing it up as a commercial fisherman to where they were going to look back at his model. And it's going to be forever known as the, the Peter way of fishing. No, history would have forgotten him. And so here's the reality for everyone in the room today. You're just like me. Because the reality is you and I, we're just like Peter. We're just ordinary people. And when Peter is faced with the undeniable truth of who Jesus is, his response is surrender. So that begs the question, is that a common, ordinary response from an ordinary person to an extraordinary Jesus? I think that's a worthwhile question. Should that always be the reaction and the response of someone who's met with the truth of Jesus, just total and utter surrender? Let me ask you this. What's your response? I want you to think about that for just a second. 
I mean, I really want you to ponder this this morning. What is your response to the truth of who Jesus actually is? Not just what's your response in a moment. But if I looked in at the story of your life, what would the story of your life tell me about what you believe about who Jesus actually is? What would your response be? If we just put an open microphone right here and brought you up one by one and said, what is your response to the person and the divinity of Jesus Christ? What would you say? And would your life accurately reflect the truth and the vulnerability of your response? I want you to ponder that question, gang. We're gonna move on, but I want you to really think about that question. So now Peter is emptied of himself. Peter is humbled. He calls Jesus Lord, and he's in obvious awe of who Jesus is. Do you ever read the Gospels? Do you ever read the Gospels and step back, and you're just in awe of Jesus? I don't know if you know this or not, but one of the things that I often find myself in is in lots of conversations with people about Jesus. You would think that goes with the territory, being someone who, for a living, talks to people about Jesus. And it does. I have lots of conversations. And would you believe me if I told you that not all of those conversations are good? Shocking, right? That sometimes people are very combative. Sometimes people are very intellectual and think, well, I'm smarter than you and I figured this out, therefore I'm an idiot. Which might very well be true, gang. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't doubt any of that reality. But what's interesting to me is when I read and I see how Jesus deals with the religious leaders of his day, when he deals with the structure that he culturally exists in, I'm in awe of him. Because, look here, Jesus responds perfectly every time. And that just puts me in awe of Jesus. When a woman who is a known offender, who is caught in the act of adultery. Look here, caught in the act of adultery, which means they know she's in the act of adultery when they catch her, right? That's not something you just stumble upon on your way to the market. They know she's actively engaged. And here's Jesus in the town square where there are literally hundreds of people. And they drag this woman out to humiliate her to destroy her, all for the single purpose of cornering Jesus. And they drag a naked woman who, is in, who is, deserves to be stoned to death, according to Jewish law, for the things that she's done wrong, and drags her right out and says, Jesus, this is what Moses would say. What do you say we should do? Anybody want to take a crack at how you would handle that situation? I'll just, maybe I'll speak for us. Not well. Not well. But how does Jesus handle it? With perfect grace and perfect truth. I'm in awe of Jesus. And here Peter is in awe of Jesus. And he's scared and he's emptied and he is recognizing how sinful he is but Jesus doesn't let him grovel Jesus doesn't say that's right Peter you need me you're a fool Peter no Jesus doesn't let him grovel he says in fact he says don't be afraid hey whoa, whoa, whoa. don't don't be afraid man don't be afraid look 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 at verse 10 look at verse 10 in the text don't be afraid Jesus told Simon Brother, from now on, you'll be catching people. Wow. Now this statement, this definitive given by Jesus had a life-altering impact on Peter and the other fishermen as well. And so once Jesus says this, once Jesus meets a totally spiritually bankrupted Peter and Peter looks up at him and Jesus says, no, brother, don't don't be afraid, man. Stand up. Look, from now on, from now on, you're not going to be catching fish anymore, bro. You're going to be catching people. And I want you to see Look at what happens. Verse 11. When they brought the boats to land, they left everything. And then what'd they do? 
Say it louder. They followed him. They all came back and said, we're done. Jesus, we're in. (laughs) Wait a second. What? Is anybody tracking with this story right now? So so Luke's an investigator, right? Right? So he's given us every play-by-play. So Luke hasn't missed a conversation. Luke isn't trying to hurry the narrative along as he's like, oh my gosh, I got, you know, I still got the whole book of Acts to write. So he's not, he's not hurrying things along here. Luke has given us every intimate, intricate detail, even down to the way someone's reacting. And so there's an immediate decision made by Peter and the others with no discussion. Sons of Zebedee, James and John, they are, Andrew, they are Peter and Andrew's what? Business partners? Anybody making big decisions when you're in business with other people by yourself? You'd like to, which is why you, you go in business by yourself, right? Is there a discussion here? Is there like, all right, guys, uh, group huddle. Hey, I tell you what, Jesus, uh, we're going to get together tomorrow at staff meeting. We're going to power through this, and we'll get you an answer, I don't know, Wednesday, Thursday at the latest. No discussion, nothing else. Let me ask you this, gang. Look here. How many life-changing decisions do you make without at least asking one question? How many? I would venture to say not many. Not many. It's powerful. I can't even, and maybe you're like me, I can't even go to a restaurant and order a cheeseburger without first asking like six questions about that cheeseburger. What comes on it? Is it well done? What do you mean well done? You know what I'm saying? Like I have to ask a hundred questions before I can even order something. And here is, here's, here's a group of brothers right here who up and quit their careers because they had an unlikely catch of fish. <laughs> what? How does this happen? Well, we know these guys aren't idiots. We know that some have education. We know they're not terrible at their jobs because they own and operate a commercial fishing company in the first century. So what would cause them to quit? Somebody ask me why. why? That's a great question. Thank you. Let me examine why. Jesus says, from now on, you will be catching fish. All right, Greek lesson. Everybody ready? Okay, lean in. The verb used here is nearly unique in the entire New Testament. This is what makes people go at Jesus, right? Because he's using a verb, zogreo. Everyone say zogreo. You speak Greek. Nice job, gang. Zogreo is a verb that's nearly exclusive in the New Testament that means this to capture alive or to spare life. And it builds on the idea of the miraculous catch of fish. Watch this. Don't, don't, don't miss this this morning. The word is used in Greek literature primarily, and it's in the vocabulary of war and hunting. And so Peter had been catching fish to kill them and sell them, but now he'll be taking men alive in order to give them liberty. It's a military term. We're going to go capture people alive, and we're going to free them together. Now, let's go back and let's re-examine what Jesus says to him. Well, from now on, you're going to be catching people. Follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. That doesn't sound super cool. That doesn't sound like, I think I'm going to quit my career for that. But when Jesus comes and says, you and I, we're going to go to war. And we're going to go in and we're going to bust in the enemy's camp and we're going to take people who are alive and held captive and we're going to run them into freedom. Who's with me? And these guys are like, yeah, yep. You know, like they're ready to go. Why? Because it's all about freeing people and bringing them into freedom. The only other time this word is used in the New Testament is in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, those who oppose the Lord's servant, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. The word captive here is the Greek word, zogreo. 
It's the only other time it's used in the entire Bible. So, if you're doing the math and we're following along, the implication here is what? That people can either live their life as live captives of Satan or freed as servants of Jesus. Jesus captures people to free them. I want you to hear that this morning. So as you and I understand what was said to Peter and what was said to the others, it makes sense that they would leave everything to follow Jesus. Doesn't that sound way more worthwhile to give your life to than just catching fish? And so what Jesus is calling them to do would require their lives. They would be used to catching fish, but now they're going to be catching people. To do the second, they could no longer do the first. So what are the implications and what's the application in this text for us today? Well, I'm going to break this down for you. Because there's really one implication and one application. And so here it is. For those in here this morning who have not surrendered their life to Jesus, if you're here today as a guest and you are on a journey, I'm glad that you're here. But make no mistake, there is a, a pretty big implication in this text for you. What Jesus said to Peter is true. You either live as a captive of Satan or as a captive of Jesus. Now, you may have never heard that before. And you may think, no, no, hang on a second, bro. I don't live my life captive to nobody. And that may be what you believe, but you are wrong. You either live as a captive to Satan or you live as a captive of to Jesus, there is no middle ground. Let me illustrate for you. John chapter 8, starting in verse 42, as Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I've not come of my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to the father, I'm sorry, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there was no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? For I'm telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is because you do not belong to God. It's pretty clear, isn't it? You either belong to God or you belong to the devil. So how do we get to the place where we belong to God? If that's true and there is no middle ground, how, do we, how does that happen? Jesus has to rescue you. Bottom line. There's no rope. There's no formula. There's no prayer. There's no magic step. Jesus has to rescue you. You are in the enemy camp. You are held as a prisoner of war. And Jesus has to come in through the power of the Holy Spirit and rescue you as a prisoner held captive and bring you to freedom. That is the only solution. He must free us from Satan's power. He must take us alive. And I know that sounds intense. And I know that sounds grandiose. But it's the truth. And that the truth is what we're after in this entire series of exploring Luke. If we're just after the truth, gang. The truth is that you can only be captive to one thing in this life. And that captivity leads to an eternity. That's true. That may not feel good. But it's true. And so here's the other truth, gang, that Jesus died on the cross to satisfy God's wrath towards sin, to restore the relationship between God and humanity, to conquer Satan. And Jesus rose from the dead to prove that life after death is possible, and he did so to secure the eternity of those who believe in him. Look here, that is the gospel. Jesus died to rescue sinners Jesus died. Why? Because he loves us. And that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Why? To rescue you. We don't have to stay dead in our sin. And we don't have to spend an eternity in hell. But if we ask the Holy Spirit to save us and we place our trust in Jesus, we can be freed. We can be rescued. And so... Make no mistake, for those of you that have not surrendered to Christ this morning, that is my plea. My plea to you this morning is this. Do not be fooled. 
Do not be misled. Do not be mistaken. Do not live your life as a captive to Satan. And you may think, I don't worship the devil. I don't have a Ouija board. I watch pra- I'm a good person. And all that may be true. But apart from Christ, you will die and go to hell forever. Because good people go to hell every day. The Bible says none are good. Only Jesus is. And so I would urge you, don't ignore the stirring in your heart. Surrender your life to Jesus. Place your trust in him. And then be ready for the most imperfect, frustrating walk of your life. Be ready for two steps forward and six steps backward. Be ready for the Holy Spirit to provocate you to living more holy and more sanctified. Be ready to use your life to be a part of freeing others. And for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus, look here. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus this morning, here's a really important application for you today. Look here. When Jesus saved you and he rescued you from Satan's power, because that's exactly what happened, he did so with an invitation. Jesus said, come, follow me. And in order to follow Jesus, we must turn from our old lives and we must walk in a new direction. This means a life of obedience, joy, repentance, fulfillment, and surrender. Following Jesus doesn't mean your life has to be miserable. Yet for some reason, we're under the impression that it's supposed to be. No, following Jesus means that when life is miserable, you find joy. Why? Knowing because this life isn't forever. Let me ask you, friend, how closely are you following Jesus as your rabbi today? If you had to gauge proximity, how close are you with Jesus today? He's your rabbi, and he says, come follow me. How closely are you following your rabbi? What is hindering your ability to following Jesus closely? What is it? Look here, you know exactly what it is. You know what it is. But we make excuses all the time, don't we? What's following Jesus really look like for you? So when Jesus called Peter and he called the others, they left their jobs and they left their families to follow him. Does that mean that every single person needs to leave their family and leave their job to follow Jesus? No, that does not need to be the case. But the other answer is maybe. It might be the case. Some of you need to get away from your family because your family is toxic and is choking the joy out of you. Some of you need to quit your job and find another job because your job is keeping you and preventing you from following Jesus well. And you think, well, if I quit my job, what am I going to do? I'm just going to, it's all depending on me. Then if, if you live your life as though everything depends on you, then you are not following Jesus well. You're following yourself. Let Jesus be big. How many fish could Jesus pull into your boat? If when he said to you, go over here, I know it doesn't make sense, and do this, I know it doesn't make sense, but just do it and watch. Let Jesus be big. Some of you need to end relationships. Some of you need to get off social media. Some of you need to learn to say no. Some of you need to stop living captive in bondage to pornography and inappropriate content and alcohol and drugs. Let Jesus be big. What do you need to say no to so that you can say yes to Jesus? And for some of you in here today, hear me say, Jesus might be calling you into ministry. Jesus might be calling you into missions. Jesus might be calling you to be a church planter. And maybe you've never been in a church before that looked you right in the eye and said, yes, yes, you can. Yes, you can be a missionary. Yes, you can be a leader. Yes, you can be a preacher. Yes, you can be a minister. Yes, you can be a planter. Maybe because you've been told your whole life that ministry is for the professionals. I don't know about you, but I feel a lot like Peter. I might be good at one or two things, but I'm not a professional. What is Jesus calling you into? Does that mean you can't do ministry and still work a job? Well, sure you can. It's not a bad thing. But maybe Jesus is calling you into something more. I'm just asking each of you in here today to just consider the possibility that Jesus is calling you to something more. 
Perhaps Jesus is calling you to a deeper season of obedience. Maybe that's your more today. Look, (laughs) we can't drag our lives behind us and still be obedient followers of Jesus. Look here, some things have to go. And when there is a letting go of some things, we can fully follow well. Let me ask you this question, gang. What can you not continue doing and still be a good disciple? Let me rephrase that for you. What is it in your mind that you think you can just keep doing and keep following Jesus at the same time? Some things have to go. The rich young ruler came to Jesus. Said, I want to follow you anywhere you go, Rabbi. And Jesus says, easy, no problem. Just real quick. Go back, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then you can be my disciple. And you know what one of the worst passages in all the Bible is? Is the next line. The rich young ruler went away. What? Anybody know it? Sad. Sad. When Jesus says, follow me, the last reaction in your life should be sadness. It should be joy. What is Jesus asking you to leave behind today? What is Jesus inviting you into today? Oh, the fish he would pull into your boat if only he'd follow well. In just a moment, we're gonna head into our response time. And I think today's response time is a really appropriate one, and I'll tell you why. Because each and every Sunday as a church, we, we respond together. And the question is, what are we responding to? You're responding to the gospel. The whole point of what we do when we get together as a church is rehearse the gospel so we can be good at living our lives in it because every area of your life is to be subject to the gospel. And we rehearse that by remembering that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, he died on a cross as a criminal, He broke his body and he shed his blood. And before that happened, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body that's broken for you. And then Jesus drank from the cup and he passed it. And he said, drink from the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant. And when you drink of this, remember me. Are we eating Jesus' physical body and drinking his blood? No. But Jesus... The God of props broke bread. He broke bread to remind us of his broken body. And we drank juice to remind of the blood that was shed for sin. And so this morning when you take that bread and you take the juice and you bring it back to your seat, I want you to just for a few moments Ponder the question. What is my response to Jesus? Father, help us today. Lord, help us. These are not easy words, they are not simple truths, but they are important. God, I pray that none of us came here today for a quick fix or an escape, but that we came here today because you you have provoked us, that you have challenged our hearts, that you've called us here today so that we can meet you in a divine appointment, Jesus. That in this moment, Jesus, each one of us can can be reminded of, 
of maybe the decision we once made for you where we responded to you in the past and we said, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. And so today you're calling us into a deeper season of obedience and you're reminding us, Jesus, of what it means to be a person who exercises surrender daily. And Jesus, there's some of us in here today that we're here because you stirred in us, but we don't quite know what that means because we're not living surrendered lives and we're living disobedient lives. And Jesus, convict us of that. Call us into repentance and restoration. Jesus, no matter where we are today, remind us that you are good, that you are kind, that you are patient, and that while we were sinners, you died for us, and that we will continue to sin, and we will not live perfect lives, but that you will place in us a deep desire to put to death the former life so that you can continue to live in us. So Jesus, whatever it is we're dragging behind us today, may it be like a net that we simply drop so that we can follow you more closely. Meet us in these moments, Jesus. We ask you now, Holy Spirit, be big in this place. It's in your name that I pray.